Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Lucid, and I'm once again joined by Sai. This is Sai, and I'm once again joining Lucid. Yes, as we are entering the very deep late game, we have a bunch of crazy stuff that's happened. We've had Arithia and Pangea throw up Gift of Nature's Bounty and Arcane Nexus, and we have Gath just ravaging the world right now, growing very quickly, shifting from one opponent to another, and right now, I think the only real wild card and like who can stop him, I think it's Pan. So Penji has been consistently like I guess, uh, second in our power ratings. But as we were like approaching in towards the late game before, like you know, we'd seen the full scope of this dream horror strategy. Pan had like even been vying for the top slot. So naturally, it makes sense that you know, as the one player that hasn't like actually run in against Gath yet. So that, you know, he's the guy who we don't know yet what all he's going to be able to bear. He does remain the wild card and the only one who can, like, potentially actually stop Gath at this point. Yeah, and, you know, of course, as you mentioned with the Dream Horrors, there is a big wild card in terms of when will, when will Gath use these horrors and will other players figure them out? And this right here in this message from Pangea is the very first time we have really any hint that people may have an inkling of what awaits them. Even here, and, though, uh, the, the huge amount of unrest that he has there, where he's saying that there's like a bunch of deep yeah. horrors in his territory, Pan seems to be under the assumption that these are just there to spread unrest, rather than the fact that these are actually like elite troopers ready to go jump on an army. Yeah, so yeah, let's, let's read this here. Hello. Seems that Gath is not really happy with Gift of Nature's bounty up. I have several dream horrors in my territory, minimum 20, because the unrest of my province jumped from zero to 440 this turn. In addition, I had an even, wait, in addition, I had an even, an event. oh, an event yeah. that killed population in the same province. It's hard to believe that this event is not someone casting tidal wave. Huh, that's wild. I think the casting... I think that casting Nexus and Gift of Nature's Bounty was too early. Well, that's a hot take. <laughs> if anything, you, I, late. <laughs> yeah, you and I have been talking for like 10 turns about how it's too late. Um, I thought that Zabalba would have to help against Gath, but he won't. Instead, he wants to attack Arithia. I have to cancel my nap with Zabalba. Not that I want to attack him, but more that I want to protect him from other... So I guess protect Arithia. My goal is to restore Arithia to full size, but honestly, I don't think I can do that. I don't have enough troops that can patrol the dream horrors once unrest is too high. Oh, it doesn't seem he's put together. You were saying it's not clear. He knows that these were like controlled, charmed dream horrors. He might think they were actually cast. It's also not clear from this so far that he knows it was Gath that cast it and not Zabalba. Um, um, well, he, he does seem to know that it's Gath from the very first thing, that Gath is not happy. Oh, that's true. So That's think, true. So my perception, I guess, like, obviously I don't, you know, know what Pan is thinking, but my, my perception here is basically that Pan seems to think, oh, well, Gath is sending dream horrors at me in order to avoid, like, attacking directly to keep up with the Nat, rather than his realizing mm. that these are weapons, basically. Right. That just happened to be sitting in his province to incidentally also cause a bunch of unrest. And from Pan's perspective, he's just thinking, oh, no, I've got these annoying dream horrors. They're going to ruin my economy, not, oh, shoot, there's 20 dream horrors. I need to be able to kill these. Yeah, I think also if we get our nap lawyers out, uh, I'm pretty sure they would agree that the sending, you know, taking the unrest in a throne province from zero to 400 probably would invalidate a, a non-aggression pact. So, and I think we were talking about this in a previous episode, you know, and I, I think you, I, I'm not quite sure. I think you said that, if you knew that somebody was doing this to you and you had a good idea which player, you'd be like, yeah, the nap's void. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think yeah. basically if you are doing directly hostile actions against another player, then like why do you have a non-aggression pact with them, right? Like right. your yeah. non-aggression pact doesn't mean anything if you're already actively fighting each other. Right. Or passively. This, this still is this is like the, the boiling point of the Cold War phase. But yeah. Yeah, if I felt ready to get, attack Gath, I would you know, tell them straight up, hey, you're doing this, right. this naughty stuff and then go attack them. Like, I think that's a yeah. totally reasonable take if you're Pan here. On the other right. hand, I don't see any indication that Pan feels ready to, like, go jump on Gath now. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, I'm not sure they're ready either. Okay, I don't have enough troops that can patrol the Dream Horror once the unrest is too high. 
I will just end with no gold. Yeah, the thing is, the higher the unrest is, the harder it is to patrol. And so once it goes up to 400, you actually need... Th this is not something you can casually patrol out. You actually need, like, a real big army to patrol that out. And uh, Pan, with a huge pile of mages but no troops, well, they might not have that. Especially troops of Spirit Sight. The one thing that I will say, though, is that troops of Spirit Sight this late in the game are relatively easy to mess. Just because Logged yeah. Dead and Bone Demons have it. So yeah. you can you can pretty easily get together several hundred dudes to patrol out the uh, unrest, regardless of if it's invisible or not. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, these are turns which, I mean, even if you can amass them reasonably quickly, it, I mean, Pan doesn't have access to, like, numerous, you know, death or blood mages. Like, they'd have to use vampires and, you know, to get an army of, like, three or four hundred, which might be what they need to patrol out the... The things that might take several turns, and by that time, Gath would just move them. Okay, two turns in a row, I was attacked by Slave to Unreason. One time on my Lich that I have empowered in blood, he was horror marked, and the second time against my god. This is the only thing that can kill my god. Damn astral corruption. I need at least two wish casters to wish some artifacts and gems. I'm 100% uh, sure that Gath has some because the Gatestone now exists and is in the game, and Eerie and Zabalba said they don't have it, so it can only be Gath. This means one thing, he can insta-pop a throne and or defend any province. The fact that Gath lost Astral Corruption, probably due to him canceling it, I'm pretty sure that Gath will cast something nasty. I bet Dark Sky signed Warp PC. Okay. This, I, I agree with pretty much everything he said in here, except the thing about casting uh, Nexus and Gift of Nature's Bounty too early. <laughs> yeah, I also but, don't know if Dark Sky is really a gas spell. I would actually think that, first of all, any sort of like big global really helps the AC team. Sorry, not the AC team, the Nexus team, just because it gives them a fat influx of gems, right? So like anytime yeah. that you're, you know, putting these huge globals up, that's probably going to, you know, help them recoup the costs faster. And without those big globals emptying out people's gem treasuries, then it, it actually, you know, it does take a little while to pay for itself. And the other thing is, Dark Sky is really good on Pan, because they've got Dryads. That is true. I think the problem, though, is Gath has been blood sacrificing. Let's take a look at Dominion. Yeah, they're winning the Dominion War against Pan right now. Um, the other thing is, Gath has morale immune troops. So while Pan does have Dryads and Seductions, which are going to go really well with the morale play of, like, Dark Skies, Gath's troops all have perfect morale. So... He's going to be able to fight a lot easier in minus 10 morale than Pangea would. So it's it's a little bit of a mix. That's true. On um, the other hand, though, in order for Gath to win, he needs to push for thrones. Like, that's kind of, like, where he right. should be looking next, which means you're fighting outside of your dominion. So Dark Sky... That's is, also true. It, it's kind of a waste of gems if you're the, yeah. the offensive guy. We did have two dire portents go up. Let's take a look and see what happened. Gath has cast something. Oh, Gift of Health. Oh, wait, did Pan um, cast like the same Pangea. thing? Yeah, it looks like Pangea overwrote Gath's Gift of Health. Okay, so there was an empty spot, Gath cast Gift of Health, and then Pan cast it with more. And that is actually really great for the Nexus team. <laughs> like, this is this is your wet dream as a Nexus team, is that somebody else tries to put up a big global, puts a ton of gems into it, and then you overcast it, and you just get some huge haul. Yeah, and you get the global. So and you waste their gems, yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty big win. Okay, message from Pangea again. Hello again. Uh, my bet is that Gath will win this game with actually 82 territories for him, 65 for me, 47 for Zabala, 35 for Arithia. I have some tricks I want to test against Gath. Um, if this works as intended, I might have some chance to make an opportunity. I also know that Gath will cast a lot of Dome of Corruption, which are really bad against me because I move almost... I move most with only mages. On the lucky part, I have recuperation, so it's not too bad. I don't know if recuperation helps with horror marking. But yes, I don't think the recuperation is going to matter. Uh, I'm. Is there something I'm not thinking of for this, Sai? For recuperation interacting with Dome of Corruption? The only thing I can think of is surviving horror attacks and then like recuperating from the injuries, but maybe he thinks recuperation works on horror marks. Okay. Maybe yeah. it does, actually. I don't know. I don't think it does. I think it does. If it did, it would actually be a cool bless. I'm still hesitating 
with to cast some Black Death. But even if I find this spell too strong, I will hate if someone uses it on me because I rely too much on gold. Just a random thought, Gath test, or casted, pretty sure he did a pop kill spell on top of my throne and added some Doom Horror there. I'm pretty sure he will jump an army there in two turns, in, in two turns, time when my nap ends, but I can't defend it. I don't have enough troops near this location. Um, I, we'll have to go figure out what throne that was. Let's cross our fingers and see if Gath can be defeated. Let's have some fun and with a lot of hope, kick some Gath ass. Nothing personal. I like the player, but sometimes if you want to win, you need to do what needs to be done. Signed, Warp PC. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think that the like crossing your fingers thing seems uh, like, I guess, a little pessimistic, but also just a little inactive, right? Because he is the secondary power at this point, right? So he's the one who needs to be like making the plans, forming the coalition, pushing the, you know, third and fourth place folks to get in line and help you fight the big bad. And then, of course, you know, making moves of your own, right? Like coming up with your own cool tech that you can use and fielding armies. If you don't think you have enough troops to defend a throne, like you need to go spend all your gems and summon up some troops, right? Like that's that's yeah. your job. Yeah, I think there, there's a couple things that I think I might add to like what Pangea, like my thoughts on the, the Pangea position decisions that they're making. One is that they they were kind of complaining that they haven't been able to sway Zabalba. I wonder how deeply they've considered this. Like maybe they could get some concession from, like there should be a price for which Zabalba could be bought, I guess. Like, is it being cut into Nexus and Gift of Nature's Bounty? Is it some land from both players? Like what is the price to buy them? If that price is too high, then I still think you don't focus Zabalba. I think you still have to focus Gath. But it might be that you have to have like a, one point something v1 against gath where like arithia is sort of fighting him while you're mostly in a one v1 i don't think fighting zabalba at all helps your position as pan even if you want to protect arithia that's the one thing that i'm like i think it would, i don't know if they exhausted all options in negotiation but i can't understand why pan wants to be an aggressor against zabalba i mean i can understand why they want it but i don't think it's a good idea yeah, the only thing that I can think of basically is if they don't think that Gath is like as close to winning as we seem to, right? Because, you know, we have yeah. the uh, omniscience advantage. So it could just be that they're thinking like, well, you know, I also want to like fight and get stronger and whatever. And Shib's not around that much. And I think we can we can take him. So let's go like beat up Shib. And then sure, we are worried that Gath is probably going to win this game. But, you know, this is a war that we can win. Uh, we uh, you can't really sway him. So let's protect Arithia by beating up the guy who we can actually beat. But but like, if I, you're I, worried I, about protecting Nexus, you can just like give this province to Arithia or some, pro it could be some province on their border where they're going to have Dominion and they just put their Nexus caster and mages here and then like if Arithia dies that's fine, you still get to keep Nexus up. You know, I mean, you can try to help them peripherally, but yeah. Yeah, he's, he's I interrupted Arithia as like a real power in terms of like number of provinces and so on. Yeah. Uh, that does require actually winning field battles. Yeah, which we haven't seen them do in a very long time. And it's going to require Pan winning field battles. But yeah. Okay. Some Gath messages. Do you, do you feel like yeah, reading any of these? Sure. All right. The guy from battle was pretty epic. I guess you should agree. The fun fact is that if Ares set up a proper defense around his god, I couldn't take it without huge storm demon losses. But he did exactly what I expected him to once again. Now he has some Syrian and Levites in his capital, so we wish our former brethren good luck in their new home. Ares war <laughs> should be essentially over for me now. I have no interest in any of his remaining stuff, though I will still raid here and there, I guess, and will be happy if Shib goes for it. Bullet confirmed that this is the last turn of his peace with Arithia. So Gath has finally grown three. With three growth thrones, I was expecting it to happen around turn 25, but turn 94 works as well, I guess. Another That's thing funny. that went well was Sickle Farm Destruction. Latch of Script was pretty awesome. Planning for Out of Script Cast is something I did quite a lot in this game as well. For example, Jabalba, where we were doing Cleansing Grip with one Devil and Grip Cleansing with another to avoid any random interruption. But I didn't think of this particular option. It was very cool. Oh, yeah, that was the gem thing that we commented on uh, yeah, and in the I, last battle. Where even though we he, commented about it, I don't fully understand what happened. Like, I, was, uh, he, I remember he summoned an air elemental, but it didn't so, happen in the first battle or something. So in the first battle where he's um, jumping the province defense, he didn't summon air elementals, right? Because he was casting a, a different spell that required gems. Uh, in the second battle, he wasn't able to cast that first spell, right? Because he didn't include the extra gems for it for the second fight. 
So he went oh. off script during his first rounds of casting, and he had these air gems in his inventory, so he off scripted the air elementals. Which Interesting. Good. Yeah. Because that's a... Okay, now I understand it. So that's actually a weird interaction in Dominions, that if you have conservative gem use clicked, you won't use spells that require gems when you go off script. The exception to that is if you script a spell that uses gems, and for whatever reason you can't cast it, it will use gems to cast some other spell. So, it's kind of weird. I don't think he even had conservative gems spending on, right? Because the whole oh, okay. goal was to get those air elementals out. Um, okay. But yeah, it was it was really cool. And let's see. Um, I think we were down here. Oh, uh, yeah. We actively worked on it together, and I fully funded this operation, so now we just have to evacuate the guys home. Obviously not planning any more sickle stuff this game unless it somehow drags out. Pan really shouldn't have stopped doing it with me. <laughs> okay, I don't know about that, but yeah, he did. He did make him pay for it. But yeah, that was. It was a very cool jump. Yeah. yeah. First Doom Horror, which happened last turn, and when Prophet Caleb got attacked by Kurji. Now we'll have to wait a bit. Post postscript: The tarts you will see hanging around are just feeble-minded guys, so that Pan can see them this turn. They were all the potential gift of health material, and some are even Hall of Fame because, as I said before, my Cetarian luck was pretty terrible. Instead of casting Gift of Health, I am Gift of Reasoning the Male Titans now, and they even immediately jumped into Hall of Fame upon becoming commanders. I am attempting the base cast of Water into an empty slot. Of course, even if it succeeds, they will know from Nexus it was not large, but even then, it may take some time to dispel, and in the meanwhile, it should kill some dryads. Yeah, let's see. Did... That did not go up. Yeah, it looks so. like it fought the... Actually, if you look at the global messages, that might have been the one that got overwritten. No, no, this was um, no, this gift, was gift of, of health. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that Gaths, this one probably went up first, and then Vengeful Waters went up either second or third, but whatever it ran into, it failed against. So. Right, because it was a low cast and the slot yeah. was taken. It's interesting, he says that he didn't cast Gift of Health, but given that you know we did see it in the global message thing, it looks like he changed his mind about that. After sending <laughs> that message. Yeah, that's true. Okay, and then the final message from Gath. A lot of oh, this is probably where he changed his mind. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of stuff has changed in the last few days, but I decided to keep the previous messages so you can see the evolution of my thinking. The thing that happened is Pan cancelling Shibalba now. On the one hand, it is great for me because it brings me and Shibalba closer, and Shib is the only nation other than Pan that I worry about. On the other hand, this action should be Pan is going for Throne Rush and likely Doom Horrors to destroy my thrones. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Knowing War PC, he would not have cancelled that proactively while being in war with the second biggest power. It just makes no sense, and I don't think he considers himself powerful enough to handle me, Shibalba, and TC while having Erythia and Agartha as allies. And if it is about ob obligations to Eri to protect them, he should have done it to turn a Shiv Eri nap was cancelled, not now. Obviously, I'm not too worried about Pan taking thrones from other people, because I have the tool to deal with that, but I am very worried about Doomhars destroying mine, so my job now is to defend them as much as I can. Another change is that I am casting double gift of health on top of Vengeful Waters, because an empty slot is very valuable, and this gives more chances to hit it. Also, I'm willing to spend many gems on different stuff, because this way, they should think that more was invested into any global that maybe manages to occupy the slot. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Didn't it, end up uh, working out for him, but... Yeah, so from the messages that we got from Pan, Pan doesn't seem to believe that they are throat rushing, at least. He, like, that, that doesn't seem to be uh, on their mind at all, assuming that the messages aren't, like, you know, fourth-level meta right. diplomacy or whatever. Right, yeah. Which, Which at uh, this late in the game, is kind yeah, of this late in the pointless. game, I, I would doubt very much that that's a factor, uh, especially because... Uh, if they try for a throne rush, it's going to be obvious well before the players are going to be able to see the episodes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I don't think they're, I think they're panned so far. I mean, it was, you were talking about kind of their character in the previous game, and they really have been playing like a very, very much like a kind of networky diplomacy, like, their scripting has been amazing in a lot of these battles, right? And they've done some really cool things, but it's this kind of like, slow predictable kind of plays that they've been doing so yeah, some of the some of the folks commented in the like in the youtube comments that Pangea has never been in a 1v1 right yeah so yeah i don't i don't know and i think what gath is saying that i mean this lines up with what i was thinking which is that it doesn't make sense why why if he's fighting gath would he declare end his nap with Zabalba? And the literal only answer that Gath could come up with is he must be throne rushing. And to me, that makes sense. I can't think of a reason why you would open up a second front either. The only thing what that I can think of is basically considering it freedom of movement and basically thinking of the war as a 2v2. So Pan might just be thinking me and Ari are a team. Shibalba is on Gath's team and doesn't seem to be switching sides. 
So I want to be able right. to fight both other players on the enemy team. Yeah. And it couldn't even just be that he had been trying all this time to get Shivalva to switch sides, and it was only when the diplomacy failed that he canceled his nap with Shivalva. And, you know, it just took this long, you know, real time-wise before he was able to make that decision. Speaking of 40 diplomacy, I didn't notice this when we were reading it, but he would not have canceled the nap proactively while being in war with the second biggest power. Oh, I, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nice try, buddy. <laughs> he, um, oh, he might actually be placing a huge emphasis on the power of the Nexus and Nature's Bounty. Like, so it's definitely very possible, especially for, like, you know, players that are, like, kind of overthinking their opponent's position, right? Because you have to understand, like, remember that these guys are spending, like, week per turn, right? So right. if he's, you know, really dedicating the time to figuring out or trying to figure out all the cool tricks that Pan can do, and he has no idea what resources Pan has, and he has infinite money and infinite gems, he might just actually feel like Pan's stronger than him, even if it's, we know that it's not true. Yeah, I mean, we're not anywhere close. That, that, how long has Nexus been up? Like three turns? Four turns? Four, maybe? It hasn't uh, paid itself back yet. So it's going to be a while, and especially if they're getting Wish Farm set up with Golems. It's going to be a long time. Pan's power level is going to be lower than Gath's, I think, for the next at least 15 turns. I think I actually think that Gath with the Defile, Defiler of Dreams setup that they have, that they are actually going to just flat out outscale Nexus and Gift of Nature's Bounty, even in like the very long run. Um but you could make an argument that they might kind of equalize or like even out after like, I don't know. 15 or 20 more turns after a long enough time frame. Yeah. Whatever that might right. be. Right. Um, yeah. That's fair. I, I was more, I wasn't saying that I believed that Gath is ahead. I was saying that it's very possible that Gath believes that. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Pan is actually stronger than he is. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I think I mean, look, this guy has like 200 dream powers. I don't think he believes it. He can't. It's impossible. He knows he must know. There's no way you put in all the time to do all the sweaty scripting to like get all the to get all of them and not know what you have. Yeah, true. Yeah. He, I mean, he does know that he's pushing for a win, right? Yeah. So yeah. he he does seem to like at least yeah. recognize like you know where he's yeah. at in terms of what stage of the game. But you know, I, I think that he's just giving his or I think that part of why he's saying that is is just trying to give his opponent his due. Yeah, that's fair. I think I think it's diplomacy. That's what I think. I think it's a meta level diplomacy. Okay, let's see. We get what is this? This looks kind of interesting. Looks like this is a returning setup. Yeah, he wanted to make sure that nothing could oh. jump on this that would um, botch Vortex of returning, so he triggered it himself. Was this the? Oh, he got the sickle. That's why he wanted to get him out. Yeah, I was wondering if he picked him up. He did, and he got. Oh no, boots of long stride. Okay, what else? Did he pick up any other gear? Oh, he got the the ancient casket. Those are expensive. That's pretty good. What are the scouts? Yeah. Oh. Oh, nothing. Okay. They're just there to be extra commanders. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything else. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, and then Gath hits this. <laughs> this, this is the same province. That's interesting. Um, yeah. It, it's interesting to me that the uh, spectral guys stuck around. I guess because the vortex of returning cleared them out, but I assume that they would still disappear. Uh, spectral guys? The hmm. uh, wraith, the wraith lord, and the long dead horseman. Like those aren't permanent units. Oh. They they disappear well, after the battle. They're there for the whole phase. They're there for all of magic phase. So they disappear when the magic phase ends. Yeah, right. So it's similar to stacking how you can stack horrors in a province. Uh, right. Like yeah. Oh god, it looks like we're gonna see the lumber construct again. Oh this boy. thing, this monster. Twenty-one magic resistance. That's not bad. Oh, there's tarts here. There's a bunch of tarts here. Yeah, yeah. Like we've seen that. All right, so most of those are regular unit or feeble-minded guys. Oh, that's a real tart, actually. That those are two real tarts. That guy yeah. Is here. Oh god, is he gonna get all of these? I. These it's so hard to get commanders. They are feeble minded. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you you have to be really rich to gift of reason a tart that's not unfeeble minded yet. So 
I was thinking that like maybe he wasted gift of reason on these. It's possible, but it's also possible that they just rolled commander but evil minded. All right. Well, some of you are wondering what is stronger, horrors or Tartarians, and I think we've answered this. Or at least this many horrors, yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. It's hard to super combat in this many. I mean, this is brutal. You know, it's interesting because I would think that out of all of the units that you could throw against a Tartarian and like have it actually do okay, um, a guy that's doing lightning damage should be able to hold up pretty well. But apparently not. Just the combat stats are uh, too different. Like the Tartarian Cyclops. Yeah. Are, like particularly given that they've got the preset afflictions, uh, they just can't hit the horrors. Yeah, it's only 11 attack. And I mean, they do have magic weapons. Uh, I think some of these guys have, like, this guy has the Thunder Fists, but. Yeah, those are the guys that, that I was saying, like, should theoretically be able to hold up against our carries just because, you know, they've got the yeah. elemental thing going for them. But in practice, they they, they just can't because their, their stats are too low. And, like, if you look at the horror stats, like, these guys have um, crazy attack and defense. Ooh, what happened here? Oh, he's stunned. Yeah, 18 and 20, that's more like it. They also, have, some of these have damage reversal, too. Yeah, these guys do. Verse 13 in Amar, that's pretty good protection. But hearts are just good. Yeah, and uh, you have to also now see the, the power of just a couple of these guys and know that Gath has, like, literal armies of these things sitting around. Yeah. This is, this is a reminder that even if you collect a lot of good toys, if you're not able to organize them into an effective army, it's not going to do much. Yeah, like those Tartarians with, you know, gear and a couple buffs from some friendly guys should have been able to take on horrors, right? Because, you know, doing elemental damage with gear thug isn't that impossible. Yeah. And then I, I, you... I do think when you're fighting into a horror harmonica, it, it makes you really, like, if you would say, like, this is the normal, like, distribution of army strength, um, once the horror harmonica golem is deployed it changes it. You then get a U of what you have to do. You can do a lot of low commitment things, but the medium commitment stuff is really hard to do with a horror harmonica on the field. Just because there's so few things that can like actually counter it that, that you're just going to lose to. So like putting together stuff like this, which might be an interesting medium commitment army otherwise, is just a complete liability. So you actually have to protect these guys. I will say that given that he's team Wish and AC, that he really should be like gearing up these guys because gem stuff is yeah. theoretically cheaper for him. And the, these guys are not like valueless chassis, like especially right. the non feeble mining Tartarians. Like you, you really should be yeah. fucking these guys up. Uh, let's see what he put on them too. I think one of the best things, if you're only putting one item on is like the uh, Skultata Volturnus, especially if horrors are around. It's just is like super value for that. Oh, the Earth guy's completely ungeared. I think there was some gear yeah. on the Water Death guy. But some of these, these aren't commanders. Yeah, I, I thought there were more commanders than there were, but like, it's really only these two. Or no, this one. Is there really just one commander? Oh no, two, this one. But she doesn't have any arms. Yeah. And She's been one. cucumbered. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this guy would would definitely not mind a Skultata Volturnus or something. Um... Mm. The lightning hat's also pretty good. Yeah, I think that guy would lose his chains, though. Um, yeah, I mean, then you put on a, another weapon. But Yeah, I mean, the other thing is we're just stacking attack gear on them. I mean, you kind of know, like, it's not a surprise at this point that you might have this golem jump on you. Yeah, I thought, I like the ring of the heart, haste heart item on those guys. Oh, like the heart of quickness thing? That's what it's called, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it gives you a chest bad. wound, but uh, it gives you quickness and I think fire is or poison resistance or something. And then those guys also have, um, since they have no encum like encumbrance for melee fighting, then you know once they do their couple of buffs, they can be fatigue negative. So they they're basically you know strictly upside for quickness, even you know ignoring the chest wound. And then oh, the does that? I didn't know it worked that way. So if you get a chest wound, it will increase your encumbrance, but that doesn't apply to melee. Uh, the, the combat on zero encumbrance guys remains zero even with the chest wound, yeah. Oh, wow, I had no idea. That's amazing. That's yeah, a so good... I'll file that away. Yeah, upside is for the undead. And then the other thing that's great about that is just that, like, they really value having high attack, right? Just because you want to smack people with those chains as many times as you can. Yeah. Um, and they also have decent length, right? So they actually become, like, decent repel tanks if you can combat stats. 
Yeah, and you know you would do boots of quickness, but they don't have feet, so yeah, I guess that's why the heart of quickness. Yeah, it has to be the heart or the armor. But the armor <laughs> tends to be more valuable because you need to, you know, use that mm -hmm. block for your MR or resistances or whatever. Oh, it looks like we had Pangea buying some Nifl Yarls off of their previous enemy. Yeah, Pangea Interesting. Seems to really like diversifying his portfolio of units. Pangea is just wheeling and dealing. He he's loving these. I mean, it would be a fun player to play with. I would like to have somebody that's like, hey, how about a thousand dollars per Nifl Yarl? Be like, okay. Yeah, and you'd kind of commented before that he's like very much a diplo player. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he seems to be just, I think that he, he just finds this sort of thing really fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder if we're going to get to see another Umbral conversion because that was pretty interesting. I want to see what he does with the Umbral in terms of like how he sets up, sets them up in his army. Uh oh, this is a real fight. I think this is the throne. This uh, is the, the throne. So Bob was trying to take that. Gath is also kind of near. But we were wondering, this is like the throne where it's like, Pangea was near it, Zabalba was near it, Arithia was near it, Tianchi was near it, or he was, was theirs. Because um, I was curious to see what Zabalba was going to be doing in this fight. But it doesn't yeah. look like he's doing anything weird. There's um, some quickening. That's noteworthy. Did he get on these dark vines? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. This aussie has got quickness, though. Yeah. And one of the things that you're kind of seeing here is that, like, even though the, the storm is up, the Oblongles are still so much faster than the Dark Wines that they just run right by them. Yeah. Did, I'm not sure what TNT tried to do. It doesn't look like too much. Yeah, I think that yeah, okay. I had initially thought that this was a real fight from TNT as well, but it looks like this was just like what had been left behind in the fort. Yeah. I don't think he really even put gems on the mages, which I think is understandable. Yeah. So that was, I, I think that was down here. That was this one. Yeah. So this goes to Zabalba now, and Zabalba has an army over here. Pan has an army right here. Arithia with no armies in sight, and they're going to be probably getting attacked by Zabalba. So I think that from the message from Gath, did we, did we hear that this turn is the first turn of hostilities between Zabalba and Arithia? So, yeah, the uh, countdown ends this turn. So next turn, we should be seeing Shivalda join in in Sakurithi as well. Yeah. You know what I feel like for this for this Pan declaring war on Zabalba thing? I think the thing is, is that Pan really, really, really wanted Zabalba to help with Gath. Like, that's really what they wanted. And it's easy to understand why. But Zabalba's like, hey, there's this food near me. Nobody was helping when I was fighting Gath earlier. You know, I'm going to eat this food first and you fight Gath and then I'll come back and help you later. And Gath, like Pan would vastly prefer that Zabalba help them now and not eat their global partner. But and I think it's like a thing where it's like, it's like he preferred it so much that when Zabalba's like, no, even though it doesn't make sense for him to then declare war on Zabalba, I think he felt like he kind of had to just because like he had been talking about, like he wanted the other option so much. And the other guy said, no, it's like, well now I'm kind of, it's like almost to spite him, right? Like you've, you've refused my advances too many times. I, I wouldn't call it spite. I, I genuinely think the Panda sees this as a two to two. Yeah. Okay. And you know, he tried it's to nice. all the, it didn't work. So we did that lie against the under outline. The 2v2, it's bad news for Pan and Zabalba. I mean, for Pan and Arithia. Yeah, unfortunately. I, and it's one of those like, when you look at the globals and you look at, like, the theoretical matchups, Arithia should be able to do quite a lot. But, you know, the, the theoretical yeah. power of this nation just hasn't kind of been on display. And it, it's it's been very interesting, like I mentioned uh, a couple turns ago, just kind of comparing them to Pangea, uh, in large part just because they have such similar toolkits, right? They, they both have... Yeah. Them big astral mages they have good diversity from their like bigger mages and then of course they have the various summons that they've been able to pile up throughout the game to do out of communion stuff but in spite of the fact that like they both theoretically should have access to this pretty broad array of options only pangea has been the one to, to like really show how to put in work using those tools yeah 
So just a quick look at, at army positioning here. We've got, you know, one of the questions we had last episode is like, what's Gath going to do? Are they going to choose like to come percolate through here? Maybe come try to go for this throne, right? Or, and like basically conquer Arithia? Or are they not? And I, there's certainly no, <clears throat> no Southern movement. I think we're seeing Northern movement. Like, I think this army's making its way up here to vie for this throne, which is interesting. Could be fighting Pangea with that army. Yeah, that's uh, also the true. Throne there as well. It's like a little bit far. Like if you look at how much Pangea territory needs to get through to get there. But it's at yeah. least a consideration. And that also means that, you know, like even if the goal is not like or rather, even if the throne is the end goal, the like midterm effects of moving towards that throne means just head on fighting Pangea, which, you know, if that's something that you want to do anyways, makes it a pretty good choice. And then the other one, of course, is the Agarthan throne, right? Because that's going to be much easier to take, assuming that you can get there. It just runs into the similar issue of needing to go through Pangea's army first to get it. Yeah, if Gath takes an army here and takes Pythium from Pangea and kills one of these Sage Doomstacks, I think basically this entire region is going to fall, except maybe this, this throne still has an army. But I think basically everything here would then fall if he kills this one army. Like, he, he's going to win an entire player worth of stuff by knocking this army out, if he could. So that's yeah. definitely a consideration. And I also think that even though, like, he knows that he's pushing for thrones, a major part of Gas' strategy overall has been trying to just take and win these big fights, right? Because he knows that he can, and if, if you are capable of winning the big fights, like, that's the easiest way to destroy a nation. Just, you know, straightforward. Fight. Yeah. I think you have to be really careful against Pangea with a straight fight, though, because I do think it's the one nation left that if you... And, you know, they've been testing battles and stuff, not as much as Gath, but a, a fair amount, right? So if you put this... Like, if you take this army and you just tee it up on top of this fort and you just say, like, I'm going to storm it, fuck you, I'm pretty sure Pangea could kill it. Like, I I don't have this... Just find a cheap way to do a huge amount of damage to it. Right. Like one of the Vortex of Returning things or the yeah. um, Rigor Mortis players. So something along those lines where he can just do a, what's the word, an uneven amount of damage to it. Right. I did not have that feeling against Zababa, or with Zababa. I felt like Gath could just put something anywhere on a fort and just take it. I don't think they can do that with Pan. So my guess, if I were playing the Gath position, I would be a void, like, sure, maybe you go on top of a fort, but you, I think you're going to, it's going to be a much more kind of poke and prod game than we saw against Sabalba, or at least that's how I would play it. I wouldn't keep an army there necessarily, you know? That makes sense, yeah. And given yeah. how late in the game it is, you do have lots of options for shifting up your script and settling right. in new and different tools to kind of counter the counter, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, so we've got these guys massing here. We've got, I don't, I mean, I guess, okay, these, we have one army massing here from Zabalba to take this throne from Arithia. So that will probably happen next turn. And Arithia with a huge pile of majors and some draconians here where they might... Maybe we get to... I would love to see Arithia do at least one more good showing. And, and we might get the opportunity to see that here. They're going to fight Zabalba with Perpetual Storm up. You can't ask for a better situation for, for Arithia to actually win one of these fights here than they, they might get the opportunity for next turn. I agree, actually. I think that they really, really do need to try to take that fight. The only thing that I would say is, like, I guess awkward is just the possibility of magic-based shenanigans interrupting that movement. That's true. That's so true. If, if Shibala does, like, a major magic-based move, like, talking with both, like, a bunch of, like, you know, cloud trapezing mages and also, like, a Stygian pass to get onto that fort then he can do a magic base fight against just the mages that are patrolling without the troops in front of them, and that could be brutal. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, one of the good plays I think Zabalba has is Elementals still. I know Zabalba. Uh, so, especially if Arithia was doing, like, some mass Elemental play, which, you know, having a Nexus up certainly helps, right? So, you know, they could do some mass Elemental play as part of winning a fight here against Zabalba, and that would obviously be thwarted by a gym bait, so... I mean, um, you could do just like massive enough gem commitment to survive the gem bait, but yeah, that, that's pretty harsh. I think it might be worth waiting an extra turn for Arithia. Just yeah. between the consideration of like the army interruption and the gem bait thing to basically do your major fight as a break siege. 
Yeah, I, I think that's the safer option. But you lose a lot of initiative, right? Because then if you do that, you have your whole army pinned here. A really cunning Zababa player is going to be like, okay, well, I'll put a Wind of Death trap here and I'm going to jump on top of these two forts. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, there are there are a lot of ways to punish that. I'm just saying that like, if Eridia yeah. wants to do like one big death ball battle, right. he might take it this next turn or he might wait a turn to do it. So there's, there's no uh, guarantee that we get to see that big showing that we've been kind of hoping for from Erythia for a while to come out on this this very next episode. But I mean, you know, the tools are in place and I think that that throne is going to be where we would see a big fight if Ruthie has a big fight left in them. Yeah. And th this flip-flopping you and I were kind of just doing on like, oh, well, you could do this and could do this. Th these are problems that emerge with having split armies in the late game. It is really dangerous splitting your armies when you need to potentially recombine them. There's a lot of ways for them to get messed with. So, um yeah, and, and, and even, there's we, there's not a great single silver bullet solution to like be like oh I, I'm gonna rejoin them in a safe way now. But go yeah, ahead. the other thing is that we've been kind of like you know talking about it for a couple of minutes, but Eryfi has probably been playing the wine in front of me game for a whole week. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. I think we've covered most of it. That, let's see if we can. The other kind of thing I just wanted to look at before we end this episode is. Which of these Pangea thrones was it that uh, they were one, talking right? about in their message? Yeah, the with the 400 it. unrest. No, it's this one. Oh, no, I, I meant the, the throne that he was saying that he didn't think that he could defend is the is that one. The oh, yeah. Because yeah. well, I guess uh, he, he did mention two thrones. He both mentioned the 400 unrest, but he also mentioned that like he has a throne on his border where with Gak, where he doesn't think that he can mount an actual defense. That's the, the, that, that cave throne is the one that he was saying he just didn't have enough troops to defend it. Maybe. I mean, he actually has thralls and dark vines and stuff around here. I mean, he has as many actual troops as I think, I think we've seen anywhere on the board over here. I don't know about the mage core, but... The thralls, they're not real troops. Yeah. It could be this is the one, though, because this isn't on the border, but he he was worried about Gath having a gate stone, and he he truly does have nothing to defend this one. Like, this one's just wide open, and it's got 400 unrest in it. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that's where Gath is going to do the uh, Doom Harp of Magic Base attack. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've, we've kind of finished this turn. What do you what do you have for, for thoughts here as we, we wrap up? The one thing that I want to see, which we kind of haven't, is Fairy Trod. And the reason mm. I, I want to see it is that we've seen so many different locations where the, like, point of the critical battle is a forest. And I'm just like, Fairy Trod, Fairy Trod, and then nothing yeah. happens. <laughs> Yeah, you used them to great effect in the your Pangea game, you know, a couple well, of years ago now. To be fair, that's uh, Pangea, right? Like, you know, MA Pan doesn't really have native magic phase options that aren't fairy trod. But I don't think I used them that much. I think I, I did it loose, like, for a little bit at the end. But here, yeah. we've got, like, a situation where Pan's the guy who's benefiting from Nexus. So, you know, he actually should be able to use this quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, I guess the the, the trick doing it now is Astro... Oh, no, Astro Corruption's down. And we don't have a uh, cataclysm. Okay. I was thinking for a minute, okay, yeah, you have to worry about horrors though, but it, actually probably not. Yeah, that would be really cool to see. I, I think that's the thing is there's going to be a, like we're, we're at the phase in the game where there can be whole armies moved in the magic phase now. And we haven't seen a lot of that yet, but uh, I think there's every reason to expect it going forward. Pan, it's certainly on Pan's radar. So yeah, the, the one, I guess, like downside to doing it is that it is very expensive. Which is why I wouldn't expect to see that much of it from Gath until they are just doing actual throne rush, right? Because like that's yeah. you're emptying your treasure anyways, so you you're you can afford to splurge and use these very expensive travel spells. Whereas with Pangea, they should feel relatively rich, and it, it is like because you can use both death and nature gems on it, and you have the big death mages in the form of like liches and vampire lords, and big nature mages in the form of pans. It should feel very accessible. Yeah, Compar it, like in comparison to Gath, who I guess also like you know has the big mages, but um, probably has both fewer gems and is like actively hurt from spending them. Yeah. Okay. Oh god, let me look at this army graph again. What the hell is happening? Oh, Pan's actually climbing. Just look at how much Gath stuff there is. There's so much. Yeah, and like uh, there's we, so I've much throughout the game that like initially that had been like the blood patrol graph. Um, and yeah. in particular, if you look at, like, Shivalda's massive dip in the army chart thing, that really m was mostly his blood patrollers getting destroyed, right? Yeah. Pan, or, uh, sorry, Gath did that super effective raiding in order to 
like shut down the blood hunting provinces. And in doing that, he just killed piles of corpse hunters. On the same lines, uh, a major great portion of uh, Pangaea's uh, army count there are those thralls, right? Like when you look at that, point, yeah. it's like two hundred troops, but it's thralls, and that does yeah. Take, like I think Pan has more garbage proportionally than by than Gath by like threefold. I don't even think it's close. So, like, you know, that does say something about Pan's blood economy. Like, oh, he's got, you know, a pretty decent number of vampire lords at this point. <laughs> yeah, but, he does. Uh, it also means that the army chart is misleading and that, yeah, Pan also has garbage just because he was buying all those harpies. Right? So I mean, I don't think, it. I don't think the conclusions you draw, I mean, I think that, like, as always, the army chart is like, yeah, it doesn't say that much. But I think the conclusions you get from looking at this actually are right in that, like, the person with the most powerful army is Gath. Like in terms of just the units, and the person with the second most powerful units is Zabalba, and then Pan is in a very distant third. Um, now it just so happens that a lot, a huge percent of this is also garbage, <laughs> yeah. but well, I think the conclusion is still the same. Yeah, and and I also like completely agree that Gat has a lower percentage of garbage, um, in large part just because his patrolling uh, guys are the Levites. Right. Yeah, and they're they're pretty tough. Yeah, they're real thicker. Yeah, but yeah. All right. Well, end times are upon us. We'll we'll see you guys in the next episode. All right. See you so, see you guys. Cheers.